It's good to be in church. It's great to be in church. How many people remember 2020? I remember 2020, and it was kind of a rough season of life um, for a lot of people. And I remember that we were going through some stuff as a, obviously a nation, as a church, as a city, personally. And we were, you know, in the middle of being called murderers and super spreaders and, you know, getting cease and desist orders and telling us that we couldn't worship in front of people and all this kind of weird stuff. And so my wife and I were like, you know what, we need a little break. Where should we go in 2020 to get a little break? And all we kept hearing was that, you know, Florida is the freest state in America. Governor DeSantis is kind of a boss, so we're thinking, man, let's go to Florida, the freest, the freest um, state in America. And so we're like, let's do it. So we got, we got our plane tickets. We're going to go to the freest state in America. But not only that, we're going to double down. We're going to go to the happiest place on earth in the freest state in America, Disney World. We hadn't been to Disney World. My kids haven't been to Disney World, so we're like, this is gonna be amazing. We're gonna escape all of this nonsense just for a, like a week over Thanksgiving. We ain't, we ain't moving, just for a week over Thanksgiving. And so we get there in the freest state in America, and we get off the plane, and immediately we just see and feel fear we see and feel control, and it's just, it's worse than it was when we left here. And we're thinking, well, maybe it's just our hotel. Maybe it's just the restaurant that we went to when we got there. Because we were told that once you get to Disney World, they're pretty loose about all the regulations. You know, it's, it's, it's kind of fun. Because of COVID, there's not long lines. So we're thinking, oh, man, we're going to have so much fun at the happiest place on earth. And so we go to Disney World the next day, and we park, and we're walking through this giant parking lot, and at a certain spot in the parking lot, outside, 75 degrees, we have these Disneyland employees telling us that we have to put on a mask, even though we're outside, 75-degree weather, around nobody but our family, and so we have to put on our, our masks. Not just put on your mask, but make sure it's over your nose, and make sure it's just kind of a mask. Like, that all happened in the parking lot, and so my wife and I were immediately triggered, <clears throat> but we were willing to soldier through because we wanted our kids to experience the happiest place on earth. And so we get into to Disney World and we're thinking, oh my gosh, there's not going to be any lines. They're going to be pretty loose about things. And we walk in and it's like even more stringent. The restaurants aren't open. You can't even eat food in line. You can't drink water unless you're in a designated area. This man is commanding my nine-year-old daughter to put on her mask, and she starts crying because it was like the third person that did it. And then this guy decides he wants to make an example out of me, and so he works his way through hundreds of people, by the way, because I saw him when I passed him, and he says, sir, you need to put your mask on over your nose. And I was like, you know what? This is not the happiest place on earth. This is hell on earth. And so we took our kids and we rolled out of that place. And, and we were like, and my wife called Disneyland and they actually gave us our money back. Because we told them it was the worst experience of all time. And so it wasn't just the mask, it was the spirit behind it. It was just evil, it was evil. And so we, we, we leave there and we find a, a water park and we go to a water park and you can't wear a mask at a water park because you're underwater. And so it was the freest place in all of Orlando. And so we stayed there. We went there not one day, but two days to end our vacation. And so we ended it pretty good. But what I found was that when I got back to San Diego, which was California, which was supposed to be the most locked down and regulated, you know, state maybe besides New York in, in America, it was actually more free in San Diego than it was in Orlando. In the freest state in America. It was actually more free here. And I realized it was because of one thing. There was a church in San Diego called Awaken Church that was willing to push back darkness, push back evil, stand for freedom and believe God that we were not going to go out like that. And so I want to live in that kind of a city. I want to live in a city that, that with a different spirit over it, like the Holy Spirit. Where the Spirit of the Lord is, there is liberty. The Spirit of the Lord was not where we were. It was back here. So I want to live in this kind of city with you kind of crazy Christian people. The title of this series is called, And There Was Great Joy in the City. 
There was great joy in the city. And it's found in Acts chapter 8, that, that scripture. And it's right after the church had exploded. Um, in chapter 7, Stephen gets stoned to death. And then in chapter 8, you know, Paul, before he was Paul, he was Saul. He's still dragging Christians into prison and all this kind of stuff. So there's mass persecution in the church, yet somehow there was great joy in this city. And so in, in Acts 4, or Acts 8, verse 4, it says, Therefore, those who were scattered, all the Christians, the apostles, everybody, went everywhere preaching the word. So even though there's persecution, they scattered, they're still preaching the word. These guys are crazy. I love them. Then Philip went down to the city of Samaria and preached Christ to them, and the multitudes with one accord heeded or adhered to the things spoken by Philip, hearing and seeing the miracles which he did. For unclean spirits crying out with a loud voice came out of many who were possessed, and many who were paralyzed and lame were healed. And there was great joy, not just joy, great joy in that city. Not every city, but that city. Not just on the street corner, in the city. Not just at the church, but in the city. Not every city, but just that city. And so I want to live in that city. The title of my message is That City. A city with great joy. That's the kind of city I want San Diego to be known for. This is a city, despite persecution, there's great joy in that city. So we're going to talk about some things we can learn from Philip in the Bible about how do we have a a city of great joy, even despite whatever comes at us in this life. So the first thing we need to do is we need to be willing to preach the word everywhere. I like how they got scattered, but they just kept preaching the word wherever they went. What that does not mean is that you have to put together a three-point sermon and take your Bible to work and open it up and break down Scripture at lunchtime at your business. Don't be a weirdo, my wife says. But it does mean that you got to take responsibility for yourself. you got to live above reproach. you got to be a person of integrity. you got to work the hardest. you got to try the hardest. you got to be on time. you got to be that person in the marketplace. But you have to understand that wherever you go, your life is speaking. Your life is speaking. I was at a luncheon years ago at uh, Balboa Park, and the CEO of Sharp Hospital was there. And they had just won all these awards for being the best company to work for, um, being the, you know, the greatest hospital uh, in all these different categories in this region. And so they were asking this, this CEO, what was it about Sharp Hospital? What did you guys do to become this great um, hospital and separate yourself amongst all the other ones? And he said, I told all of my employees from the janitors to the administrators to the surgeons that everything you do speaks. Everything you do has a voice, but the question is, what is it saying? How are you treating the patients? How are you following up? What is your bedside manner like? What is the quality of work? How clean are the bathrooms? Everything speaks. Everything in our life as Christians speak. You don't have to go and preach the gospel with words necessarily, but your actions better be preaching the gospel. Your actions better be preaching the gospel. The job of the church is to change you so you can change them. Did you know that you have an atmosphere around your life? You ever been in a room and somebody walks in and you're like, ew. The atmosphere is kind of yuck. You feel like you got to take a shower afterwards. It's sick. It's, it's depressed. It's, it's not positive. It's negative. And there's an atmosphere around your life. So the job of the church is to change the atmosphere within you so that you can go out there and change the atmosphere around you. Acts 5, Peter's walking down the street. The Bible says that people were clamoring to get to him. They're bringing sick people on beds and on couches so that his shadow might just touch them. See, Peter had an atmosphere around him. His presence cast a shadow around him to the fact that he didn't have to go to people. People were coming to him because they wanted to get in his atmosphere because there was breakthrough in his atmosphere. There was healing in his atmosphere. What atmosphere are you creating when you walk into a room? Do people want to come to you or do they want to be repelled from you? Do people want to go towards God or do they want to be repelled from God? What atmosphere have you created in your life? Well, the job as a church is to get you a God kingdom atmosphere in your life so that when you go out in the atmosphere, you can understand that you have a kingdom lens in your workplace, in your career, on the baseball field, whatever it is, so that you can bring a different atmosphere and people be attracted to it. The job of the church is found in in, in Ephesians 4, 11 to 12. It says this, And he himself, Jesus, gave to be apostles, prophets, evangelists, pastors, and teachers for the equipping of the saints for the work of the ministry, for the edifying of the body of Christ. 
This is the job of the church, to equip the saints to do the work of the ministry. Now, for a lot of years, the church has misinterpreted this, this passage of Scripture. We've relegated the work of the ministry to what happens inside of these four walls. So what we've said is, hey, all the, all the leaders and the pastors, your job is to equip the saints to do kids' church. And we do have to equip the saints to do kids' church. Your job is to equip the church to do youth ministry, and we should equip the church to do youth ministry. We need youth ministry. We need kids' church. We need ushers and parkers that can smile. We need a worship team that can stay on key. We need a light team that can put the lights on when they need to put lights on. We need a, a cafe team that can smile behind the cafe so that people feel welcome when they walk into church. We need a security team that doesn't take any crap from people who are weird and crazy in our congregation. We need to equip the people for a ministry inside the church, but that's not where it stops. In fact, the real work happens out there. You come in here to get empowered and equipped, and you go out there, and you bring what the atmosphere that's on the inside of you out there. So we've misinterpreted this scripture for so long until 1975 when Bill Bright, now I'm going to teach you some Pathfinder stuff. Bill Bright and Lauren Cunningham got spoken to at the same time in the same week about the same thing. Campus Crusade for Christ, Bill Bright, Lauren Cunningham, YWAM, got spoke to, God spoke to both of them the exact same week and said, you need to start impacting culture, the seven mountains of culture. You've heard of the seven mountains of culture. It's like government and politics, the church, family, arts, entertainment, and sports, media, education, business, economics. Those are like the seven mountains of, of culture. And so on the, on the same week, God spoke to him and said, I'm seeing something. I'm seeing the church isn't doing, isn't equipping people for the work of the ministry. Wow. But it wasn't until the late 90s where people actually in the marketplace started seeing themselves through a kingdom lens, understanding that God can use them in their assignment and that they're actually called to the marketplace, that it's actually a God thing. And actually God can work through them in whatever they're doing in their jobs and in their careers. The reason why it wasn't working in the 1970s is because Bill Bright and Lauren Cunningham, although they had the right mission, they had the wrong strategy. See, they were sending college students that were begging to, for support in the ministry that could barely pay their own gas to try and go impact a CEO or a director or a manager or somebody of influence in culture. And they realized that wasn't working. They were getting people saved, some people saved, but they weren't influencing culture because they had the wrong strategy. And so in the late 90s, early 2000s, marketplace people started seeing their assignment in the marketplace as a God-ordained call that they could actually be used as a teacher, as a politician, as a media personality, as an athlete. They started seeing themselves as a tool for the kingdom of God in the marketplace. That's when, that's when uh, Billy Graham said another great work or a great work of, of God is going to happen in the marketplace. That's when he said it in the early 2000s. Once people got a hold of this message, it took a little while, but they got a hold of it. Now in Isaiah 2, 2 is where we find the mountains. It says, now it shall come to pass in the latter days that the mountain of the Lord's house shall be established on top of the mountains. The seven mountains, the mountains. The, 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 the chief mountain is the church and the mountains that lift up the church that go to the church to get equipped and empowered. Then they come down into the mountains and they influence culture. And then the people in culture come back up to the house of God and they get equipped and empowered and they go back into the mountains. So it's like this big, this big cycle, but the chief of the mountains is the church. This is how we get equipped and empowered to go influence culture. And it says, and, and shall be exalted above the hills, and all nations shall flow to it. So that's where we get the mountains. We can actually be used in what God has called us to do in the marketplace. It's an amazing thing, and it's a humbling thing. I remember I was at UCLA, this is in 1997. And I played baseball at UCLA, and that, that year, my senior year, I was captain of the team, and I was an All-American, so I had, some, I had some influence on my team, because I was pretty good at what I did. If you want to be influential in the marketplace, be good at what you do. Be the best person that you can be in what you're doing. So, so I had a level of influence on my team. So we go to, uh, uh, it comes to the picking of the regionals in all of the, all of the America in college baseball. There's eight regions all over the, the 
United States. One winner from each region goes to the World Series. So we were number one in the nation for a period of time. So we were the number one seed at the Oklahoma State region. So we went to Oklahoma State as the number one seed. Harvard was number six. Oklahoma State was number three. So we play, the first seed plays the sixth seed in the first game because, you know, you get the, the best draw. Well, we played Harvard. Well, they threw some left-handed thumber, dude, that threw like 70 miles an hour. No one could hit him. So we lose the first game of the regional. And so we shocked college baseball, shocked. UCLA loses to Harvard, you know? And uh, next thing you know, Oklahoma State is on the radio getting interviewed, and they're saying, yeah, they're just a bunch of West Coast pretty boys. They don't know how to play baseball like we do it out here. And so we're like, okay. So then we, we go to the loser's bracket, and when you lose, you have to go to the loser's bracket. So we went through the loser's bracket. We were annihilating teams. So we get to the finals, and wouldn't you know it's us against Oklahoma State. <laughs> and we got to beat them twice because they hadn't lost yet. So the first game comes, and, you know, we barely squeak by 14-1. to 1. We beat Oklahoma State in the first game. So in the second game, it's like, yeah, these West Coast pretty boys can play a little bit, maybe. I don't know. So the second game, I'm, I'm the leadoff hitter, so I ground out my first at bat, and I run to first base, and I get out, and the first baseman's like, not tonight, UCLA. And I'm like, okay. So that game, we end up winning, just barely squeaked by, 22 to two, and I hit a grand slam later on that day. So guess who went to the World Series and who didn't? We did, they, they didn't. So the West Coast Pretty Boys came to play and showed those boys how we do it on the West Coast because it's the best coast. Point of the story. <clears throat> the point of the story is there was a guy, uh, his name was Jack, and we're celebrating, we're partying on the field, we're talking trash to their fans because they were calling us names, and, and, and next thing you know, this guy comes up to me, Jack, and he was, a, he was a junior in college, he was a high prospect coming out of high school, and he comes up to me and he says, he says, John, I know you're a Christian. And I was like, barely a Christian. Like, I was like the college athlete guy. Like, that's how I, and, and so I was barely a Christian, but he, comes, he goes, I know you're a Christian. Because I had, I had poured into his life a little bit. I had encouraged him. And, uh, and he says, I want to know Jesus. I want to invite Jesus into my life. And so I took him to the dugout right after everybody celebrating on the field. And I led him through a prayer. And he got saved right at Oklahoma State in their dugout after we celebrated a victory to go to the World Series. There was an atmosphere around me somehow. I was barely even a Christian, but he wanted some of that. And the Bible says all through the Gospels that, that people would come to Jesus and he would open his mouth. It says those words, he would open his mouth. So you can be a good example, but at some point, you're going to have to open your mouth. You're going to have to share the Gospel. You're going to have to tell somebody why there's something different about you. But God can use you in your career. I was, I was watching a movie the other day called um, Gifted Hands. And it's about Ben Carson. If you don't know Ben Carson, he, he ran for president in 2016. He lost to President Trump, and then he became a part of President Trump's team. But before that, he was the number one brain surgeon in the world. The greatest brain surgeon in the world. He's a smart, smart person. Here's what he said regarding evolution. He said, the probability of evolution being true and they're not being intelligent design is like a tornado whipping through a trailer park and assembling a 747. That's what a joke evolution is to the smartest brain surgeon in the world who works on the most complicated organ there is possible. It's one thing if I say, Pastor Andre, you know what, evolution's a joke. It's another thing if the smartest brain surgeon in the world says evolution, there's no way it's impossible. So in this movie, they're talking about Ben Carson, and as a kid, he was called dumb. He didn't get good grades. He was called dumb, and his, his mom couldn't even read, but yet she made her boys read two books a week and report to her. And so uh, as they're reporting to her and they're reading these books, they're going to their mom, and they're saying, I don't understand this word. Can you explain it? And she goes, you know what? I need glasses, so I can't see it. Why don't you just try to sound it out with your brother? 
because she couldn't read. And so she raised these two boys to be brilliant minds. By eighth grade, he's number one in his class. Then he goes to high school. He stops getting bullied because now he's, you know, uh, excelling in grades. He's, he's a Christian. He's reading the Bible. It shows the Bible in the movie. And uh, his mom was a Christian. They show him going to church. And so he, 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 he's growing up in this environment where when, as a kid, he's called dumb, but then he works his way through because of uh, his mom. And he becomes like third in his class in his high school. And he gets into Yale. So he gets into Yale, but he's still a little bit intimidated because he was third in his class where everybody else is like number one in their class. And so he's, he's, he's plugging along at Yale University and he decides he wants to be a brain surgeon. So he goes to this brain surgeon who was in the program there and they said, to be a brain surgeon, you can't only be brilliant, you also have to have brilliant hand-eye coordination. And, they, and he said, and that is a gift. In other words, you can't work on that. That is a gift from God to have that kind of hand-eye coordination. So he's like, he realizes he has that, so he pursues being a brain surgeon. However, in his chemistry class, he, he feels intimidated because he's around all of these people that are so smart and he doesn't see himself yet as that smart. And so God gives him a vision. He's sitting down in this classroom in this vision and he sees the chalkboard and he sees his teacher and he sees all these equations written on the chalkboard. And then he sees himself in the vision going up to the chalkboard and writing all the answers to these uh, equations on, in his chemistry class. And then he wakes up. The next day he goes to take his test that he was intimidated by and he opens the test and he realizes the same equations that were on the board are the same equations that are in his test. And so he starts filling out this, this test and he scores a 97% on the test. And then he, gets, uh, and then he goes for the, the brain surgery um, program at John Hopkins University, which is arguably the best you know, hospital in the world. And there's two people that can get in out of 150 and he's one of the people that gets in. God had his hand on him. God had his hand on him. So he goes and becomes the greatest brain surgeon of all time. Like he's the number one brain surgeon in the world. So much so that there's a, there's a Siamese twins in Germany, this family, and they come to the United States and they say, can you do a surgery and separate these Siamese twins from the brain? It's never been done before in the history of the world. And Ben Carson, the number one brain surgeon in the world, they tell him, if you can't do it, nobody can and he says, he comes back to him and says, I can't do it. I don't know how to do this surgery and keep the kids from bleeding out. They're going to bleed out. As soon as I make that incision, they're going to bleed out. There's no way to stop it. And then he's playing pool in his house. He was praying and doing research. He's doing, now he's playing pool in his house. And he looks over into the kitchen. And he sees the faucet on and the water coming out of the faucet. And then he sees the, the faucet start to drip and then stop. And God showed him right in that moment how to do the surgery. So now he goes to the family and he says, I have a strategy. It's never been done before with kids. And it's never been done in this kind of a scenario, this kind of a surgery. He said, what we're going to do is we're going to actually go into their hearts and shut their hearts off for an hour. We have one hour where we can turn off their hearts so the blood's not pumping so they won't bleed out. But if we last longer than an hour, it will do brain damage to them. So we have to get everything done within an hour once we start making those incisions. It's never been done, but we're gonna do it here because he saw a vision. And he said, the next thing we're gonna do is we're gonna pray. We're gonna pray. And they said, you pray? And he said, every single day. And so he goes into surgery. He assembles 50 different uh, surgeons and doctors and nurses in one room and strategizes and orchestrates this surgery where he separates Siamese twins from the brain for the first time in the history of the world, and they both survive. They both survive. Because God gave him a vision. God was working through Ben Carson and all of his career, and now his life is still speaking today, and he gives all the glory to God. God wants to use you in your career. He wants to use you in the marketplace. If we want to be that city, we got to be able to preach the word everywhere, and we got to be united in obedience. United in obedience. It says, Philip went down to the city of Samaria and preached Christ to them, and the multitudes were with one accord, meaning united, and heeded or adhered to the things spoken by Philip. So they were united in what they were believing, and they were believing the right thing, what God was saying. And so there's only two places in Scripture where God actually commands a blessing. You know what it is? It's in unity, and it's in obedience. The two places God commands a blessing. First one I'm going to talk to you about is in Psalm 133, verse 1. It says, Behold, 
how good and how pleasant it is for brethren to dwell together in unity. It's like a sweet smelling aroma to heaven when the people of God are dwelling together in unity. One thing that COVID did to Awaken Church, if there was one good thing that happened, it was we got closer. We got more united. The people that didn't like what we were doing left and the people that liked what we were doing stayed and they, and they put their roots deeper. And then they invited other people that wanted to do what we were doing and then they came. And now we're bigger than we've ever been. We're more united than we've ever been. We're more on the same page than we've ever been. There's no other community like what we have here at Awaken Church. We actually love each other. We actually want to help each other. We actually want to pray for each other. We actually care how you're doing. We actually rejoice with those who are rejoicing and mourn with those who are mourning. That's the community that we have here. And then it says, it's like dew, uh, verse three, it's like the dew of Hermon descending on mountains of Zion for there in that place of unity, the Lord commanded the blessing, live forevermore. So it was that place of unity where, the, where, where God commanded a blessing. He didn't just send a blessing, he commanded it to happen. Deuteronomy 28, one to two in verse eight is about obedience. It says, and it shall come to pass if you diligently obey the voice of the Lord your God to observe carefully all of his commandments, which I command you today, that the Lord your God will set you high above all nations of the earth or all cities of the earth. I believe that San Diego has been exalted above cities all across the earth. If you talk to the visiting ministers and the visiting people that come to our city, they will say there is nothing like San Diego happening around the world. Your city has been exalted above all. And all these blessings shall come upon you and overtake you because you obey the voice of the Lord. Verse 8. And the Lord will command the blessing on you in your storehouses and in all in which you set your hands. And he will bless you in the land in which the Lord your God has given you. You mean we don't got to move to Florida? He will bless you in the land which he has given you. He'll bless you right here in San Diego. If we are willing to be obedient and in unity, God will command a blessing. He won't just send it. He'll command a blessing. That word command means full power, energetic strength, all of his might. God wants to put all of heaven behind the blessing of God when we are in unity and when we are obedient. I believe we have been very, very obedient despite what people are saying at this church. And I believe that's why God's hand, hand is on it. Why is it important that we be blessed? Because in Proverbs eleven eleven it says, by the blessing of the upright, the city is exalted. God's not just interested in us. He's interested in San Diego. He's interested in our city. If we want to have great joy in the city, we need to be united in obedience and watch what God does. Imagine if we have 10,000 people with an atmosphere of faith and power and breakthrough coming together. Imagine 20,000. Imagine 30,000. Imagine 16 locations of spirit-filled, crazy, believing Christians like you with an atmosphere around them where people are chasing us down saying, what is on you? It's because... God is commanding a blessing to come. So we need to be able to preach everywhere. We need to be in unity and obedience. And, powers, and Pastor Sterling, the third one, I bet you can guess, we need power. We need power. We need to be a house of miracles. It says that Philip went down and, and the people saw the miracles for unclean spirits crying with a loud voice came out of many people who were possessed and many who were paralyzed and lame were healed and there was great joy in that city. We need to be a church of power. I've said this a million times. This is not just an information house. This is a power house. This is a house that brings power. The job of this church and the goal of this church is to transform your life. It's to get tangible, practical, real results that you can actually see. If we're not getting results, I don't want to do this. What's the point? I don't want to just tell you things that are in the Bible. I want to see results. I want to see it with my eyes. I want to know families are getting transformed. I want to know people are getting healed. I want to know people are getting delivered and free. I want to know there's miracles happening in businesses. I want to know there's miracles happening in the lives of our families and our marriages. I want to see stuff happen. I want to see stuff happen. And we got to provide the power. If you keep reading in that, in that passage of Scripture, Simon the sorcerer was kind of the, uh, the only power that was available in Samaria. To the fact that all of the people would acclaim him as the great power of God. 
He was a sorcerer. It was a counterfeit power, yet there was no power in the church. If there's no power in the church, people are going to go elsewhere to find it. They're going to go to the sorcerers. They're going to go to witchcraft. They're going to go to the tarot card. They're going to go somewhere because we are created to have power. We are created to walk in the supernatural. So it's got to be the church that brings that, that, that supreme authority, that supreme power. Because once Philip arrived, Simon the sorcerer submitted under him and said, oh my gosh, that power you have is way better than mine. Can I give you money for yours? And he said, no, you can't buy this. You can't buy this. But the power of God, the power in the church is not just for the pastors. It's for all of us. We're to come in here and get equipped and empowered to go out and do the work of the ministry. It says in Mark 16, and these signs will follow those who believe. Is there any believers in here? Any believers in the house? All you got to do is believe in my name. They will cast out demons. They will speak with new tongues, heavenly language. They will take up serpents or they will drive out evil is what that means. And if they drink anything deadly, it will by no means hurt them. Now, now listen to me. If you have taken the vaccine and since realized there could be some damaging effects, this is your scripture. This is a scripture that you need to proclaim and declare over yourself that anything that is in you will not harm you. No poison in you will, will, will not harm you. And then it says, and they will lay hands on the sick and they will recover. This is the great commission from Mark. Verse 20, it says, and they went out and they preached everywhere. The Lord working with them and confirming the word, not the man, confirming the word. If you got the word in your mouth, God is going to chase you down to confirm it. He confirmed the word with accompanying signs, with accompanying signs. God is looking for a church who is willing to press in for some power. I was talking to this guy the other day, and him and his wife got a miracle house. And, uh, you know, like every house these days could maybe be classified as a miracle, but this was like a real one. It's a real one. It was a real one. They went to lease this house, and they had put 15 offers in, gotten no responses. They've lost 15 different offers. So they're like, you know what? We're at our wit's end. We're just going to go lease this house. So they go to this house. They end up not leasing the house, but they met the owner, and the wife gets a word of knowledge from heaven to say, we need to stay in touch with this guy. She didn't know why, I just need to stay in touch with this guy. So they go on, nine months goes, goes by. They've stayed in touch with him just a little bit. They reach out to him at the end of nine months and just said, you know, re remembered that they're supposed to stay in touch with this guy. And they reach out and they said, yeah, that house is leased. We don't have any other houses for lease, but I do have this house that's not on the market that I'd love to sell to you guys. They met him one time, got a word of knowledge and stayed in touch with him. So within 24 hours, they're under contract on this house that never hit the market. And now they realize if it would have hit the market, it would have been 200,000 more than what they paid for it because it never hit the market because they had the favor of God on their life because that was a bona fide miracle. God speaking from heaven to the wife and saying, stay in touch with this guy. Miracles happen every single day. I could tell you a hundred stories about houses and about breakthrough. A couple of weeks ago, there was this little girl five years old. Her name is Milani. Goes to our church and she fell out of a two-story window, landed on her head, fractured her back. She was bleeding in her brain. There was fluid in her brain. She got taken to ICU. The doctor said, this is not looking good. We need to induce a coma on her. The swelling's out of control. But I'm thankful that this is not just an information house, but it's a powerhouse. I'm thankful that we have people in this church that rallied around and know how to pray. I'm thankful that Tuesday morning men's prayer, we go after the miraculous. I'm thankful that on Thursday mornings with women's prayer, we pray and go after power, that we go after results. I'm so glad that we're a church that doesn't just take whatever happens as being the will of God, but understands this. Sometimes you got to pray the will of God. Sometimes you got to say, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. It was not the will of God for her to fall out of that thing. And so we rallied and we prayed. 24 hours later, this little five-year-old girl who had a death sentence walks out of the hospital completely healed. And she gets up in the morning and she gets dressed and she tells her mom and dad she wants to go to church. Come on, if we want to have great joy in our city, we need the power of the Holy Ghost. We need a church willing to preach the word everywhere. We need a church willing to sacrifice and be obedient and be in unity, even if we don't fully understand sometimes. If we want
want great joy in our city, we can have it. It's easy. It's easy. We can do it. And it's already happening. It's already happening. I'm so proud of you. We have a church like people set aside their own time, their own needs to pray for a little girl that maybe they didn't even know. We have a church that has community and we actually like get in your business and want to know how you're doing so that if you're not doing well, we can help and we can do something. We want to see your life soar. We want to see you successful. We want to see God using you. We want to see miracles in your life. So if we're willing to preach everywhere, be in unity and obedience and access power, we can have great joy in the America's finest city, which is becoming God's finest city. Amen. Come on, one more time. Why don't we clap for Jesus? All right, close your eyes. You can stay standing if you want. I'm just going to pray. Father, we thank you today that you are a God of miracles, that you are a responsive God. Father, I thank you that you sent a man to a city, Pastor Jurgen Matesius, because you saw, I believe, you saw a bunch of crazy Christians who were willing, despite persecution, despite being scattered, that we're willing to preach everywhere that we're willing to take responsibility for ourselves, that we're willing, actually willing to, to obey and be in unity, make peace with each other best we can because we want to see a city changed. Father, help us to think beyond just ourselves. I believe they're going to look at San Diego in the future and say, man, despite all of that, look at San Diego. They were the change agent that changed America. And it was that, that church that they tried to shut down, but that wouldn't bow. God, we thank you for who you are and that you are somebody who watches over your word to perform it. So Lord, let us go out with your word. God, help us to have opportunities this week to be a Christian. Help us to understand, Lord, everything we do has a voice and we carry an atmosphere. And while every eye is closed and head bowed, I want to just ask you this question. You might be here today and you've never given your life to Jesus. Maybe you're like Jack at Oklahoma State and you saw, you see an atmosphere in here that you want to be a part of. It's Jesus. It's Jesus. That's the beginning. Invite him into your life. So if that's you and you've never done that, I want you to lift your hand so I can pray for you. Is there anybody like that in here? God bless you, sir. Thank you. God bless you over here to my right. Thank you. Thank you. Is there anybody else? Is there anybody else saying, Jesus, I need you in my life? God bless you over here to my left. Thank you. Amazing. In the service, is there anybody else? Amen. With every eye closed and head bowed, let's pray this prayer. Everybody in the building, especially those of you that lifted your hand, pray this prayer. And the creator of the universe is going to come into your life and everything around you and in you is going to change. Pray this prayer. Say, Dear Heavenly Father, I thank you for sending Jesus to die on a cross for my sins. Lord Jesus, today, I invite you into my life and I ask that you would change the atmosphere inside of me so the atmosphere around me can change and so that I can help change others. Today, I declare that I am saved, that heaven is my home and that God is my Father. In Jesus' name, amen. Thanks for listening. To find out more about our locations, team, and what we do here at Awakened Church, go to awakenedchurch.com.